See how I walked up those steps? I practiced all week. No. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Anyway, I hope everyone has their Bibles. If not, there's some Bibles in the food rack. And you can turn to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. Excuse me? It does? Well, I don't know who put it in the bulletin. I didn't look at the bulletin. Well, let me see where that is, Acts 10, what they're talking about real quick, if I don't mind. <laughs> I'm sure it's not Acts 10 for me. No. It's 18, I know that for sure, but I don't know what they put 10 there. Some error. Did I send it that way? I did? What was I studying? Anyway, it's chapter 18. We'll look at verses 1 through 3, then we'll go to 18 and 19, and then we'll go to 24 through 26. So starting this morning with verse 1 through 3, it says this. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Verse 2 is next. There he met a Jew named Aquila, and a native of Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome, Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Drop down to verse 18. Paul stayed in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sailed to Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Censoria because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with Jews. Then drop down to verse 24 through 26. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexander, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed the way of the Lord and spoke with great favor, taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more accurately. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. You know, it takes more than great programs to build a great church. We have great programs going on here, but it's not enough. It takes more than hard workers and sacrificial servants to build a great church. We have that, and this year it saved the church money by changing our mortgage rate. We saved money. It takes more than big offerings. We have been blessed for our size to do as well as we do in tithes for the local ministry, in missions, for around the world, and special offerings we receive. It takes more than a super talented teachers and more than dedicated deacons to build a great church. It takes more than a great looking pastor to build a great church. But you could always pray that someday you'll have one. <laughs> it takes great people, great families, great homes to really make a great church. We are building a church here, but hopefully we are building it by building people building families, building our homes. If we do that, then together we will be building a great church, all to the glory of God. Let me just sidetrack for a minute. I want to ask you a question, see if you got the answer. i to just share something with you. The most expensive piece of furniture in a church is what? It's an empty pew. It's an empty pew. Anyway, if you look at our text, we have a great example of this here in our text in the form of this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. I believe that God intended for the Christian life to be a family affair. The Bible teaches that it is ideal for entire families to love and serve God together. And that includes especially our church family. Let me give you a few examples. In Philippians, the uh, jailer in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, 
It says, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And thou house. Let me just give you a few verses that this indeed happened. The family of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1, verse 15. Here's what it says. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Then dropping down to verse 41 of Luke. It came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Continue in Luke 1, look at verse 67. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. So there you have it, father, mother, and son. Now, it doesn't happen automatically. God has no grandchildren. As it were, he only has children. But the Bible is clear on, on the fact that God intends for it to be a family affair. Paul's wonderful friend, Timothy, came from a godly mother who was raised by a godly mother and grandmother. And my wife and I both were raised in a godly heritage, and we want to pass it along to our children, to our grandchildren. It's our job to train up children in the way they should go, the Bible tells us. And in our text, we see a married couple in this text this morning, worshiping and serving God together. So let's just look at this morning three ingredients of a great family. First, it must be a saved family. Allow me to reconstruct the story for you. And this couple is living in Rome, Italy, the Bible tells us. The name of Priscilla is a Roman name. A secular history tells us she was from a prominent family of nobility living in Rome. And Aquila is a Jewish name. So we can see that a young Roman girl has married a young Jewish boy. And that was not acceptable in those days. A huge wave of anti-Semitism had swept that land in those days, and Romans hated the Jews. And then the emperor Claudius had just issued this expelling all the Jews from Rome. In Acts chapter 18 of our text, verses 1 and 2, we see this was a family under pressure. It's always hard to have to pick up and move, especially when it's moving away from the place where you have grown up. Some of us know that. But this couple wasn't choosing to move. They didn't want to move. They were moving because they were forced to leave. And they are an illustration of the family of today. Also, under incredible pressure from without and from within, stress and tension are a huge part of the home today, isn't it? It really is. With the pressure of work, of time, finances, we choose to live under today. Think about that. And children enter the picture of the stress that goes in the family. They wind up with that same stress. And more and more, the older they get, it becomes more. So here's an eye-opener for all of us today I want to share with you. If you have a child or a grandchild that is at least 14 years old today, and beginning as a freshman in high school, I think I was 18 when I, no, at 14 years old today, beginning in high school. Here are some things to expect by the time they graduated from high school. Just listen to this. Two-thirds of their children will have used drugs. One in five will be an alcoholic. Two in five will have committed and consumed more drinks at one setting. 20% will use tobacco tobacco daily. 40% of the babies born out of wedlock. One third of all abortions will be formed by, on girls their age. 
half will be sexually active. Second leading cause of death of kids their age at graduation will be suicide. See, we need a revival in the home and in the church. We need a revival of families that starts with moms and dads getting serious about serving God. Families with a healthy fear of Satan having his way, thus a hearty fervency for drawing close to God and to one another. Satan's alive and well and is attacked in the family, church families, and the home. I don't know how anyone can raise a family today without the Lord Jesus Christ, without the help of a good church family. So Aquila and Priscilla are a family under pressure. That's what our text tells us. But they are also a family under providence. See, God was working out their problems behind the scenes for their good and for his glory. See, God is in the process of bringing something quite wonderful into their lives. You see, as they were being kicked out of Rome and were traveling east toward Corinth, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul was leaving Athens and traveling west to the same place. And when they met face to face, it was the beginning of something wonderful that would last the rest of their lives. Remember what Paul's trade was? What was he? Tent maker, right? Look at the verse 3. He's a tent maker. I imagine they were working together, both tent makers. And what do people do when they're sitting down and working together? What do they do? They talk. They talk. And what would Paul have talked about? It wasn't the New York Giants or Syracuse University. He would have talked about Jesus Christ. He would have shared his wonderful story of the gospel. Jesus' birth, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. And this couple would have been amazed at hearing the sweetest story they have ever heard. And I believe they were glorious saved because of it. That's how our God is. If we get right with him and follow his will, he will cross our paths with others who need him. God will open doors for you to meet with others who need him. It's just the right time and just the right way is God's way. So anyway, one night our preacher stopped uh, to help a man on a motorcycle that was broken down, but he was rejected. He drove off, but it started to rain. And he went back again to help him, put it into his truck he did, to get it into a shop, put him up for the night, witnessed to him, fed him, led him to the Lord Jesus Christ. His family all got saved. Aquila and Basilla had a similar experience. Not an accident, not coincidence, but providence. They became a great family against all odds. See, and to be a great family, it must be a saved family. Secondly, it must be a serving family. A serving family. Everything else we read about this couple from then on is about them serving God together. Years later, Paul writes back to the church at Rome, where we read in Romans chapter 16, verses 3 and 4, it says this, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So if you go back to our text in uh, chapter 18 of Acts, do you know what's happening to this couple? When you read this text, the same thing that ought to happen to each and every one of us after we get saved, after we are born again in Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, regardless of our occupation, our main business ought to be God's business. Worshiping and serving him, teaching and helping others, winning souls and seeking people to get saved. We have many here who own and run their own business. I know that. Many. You know, I thought about that a lot. 
regardless of our occupation, our main reason ought to be God's business. Worshiping and serving him, teaching and helping others, winning souls, seeing people saved. So we have many here who run our own business, but their main business is God's business. We have several in some areas of service or customer service, but their main business is serving God. Back in 1858, for those who were alive then, Edward Kimball was a businessman in Boston. He also was a Sunday school teacher of older teen boys. In his class was a, was a kid named Dwight. So one Saturday, he decided to visit each boy in his class to see if they were saved, if they knew Jesus personally as their Lord and Savior. So he visited Dwight at the store where he was working, and Dwight got saved. Then by 1879, Dwight was an evangelist who was going out doing crusades. One of the men at the crusade was named Frederick Meyer, who was pastoring a small church, not doing too much, but hearing Dwight, the evangelist, lit a fire under him, and he became a world-known preacher. His travels brought him to America. And preaching on a college campus, a student walked the aisle and got saved one day. His name was Wilbert, and he got saved and went into the ministry. He had a guy named Billy to help him. Billy preached a crusade in Charlotte, North Carolina, North Carolina, and he, that was so successful that a local businessman association decided to have another big crusade. Billy couldn't do it, and they hired a preacher named Ham at the crusade. A young man came forward and got saved. Another Billy was the name. Know his last name? Billy Graham. Millions have been saved under his ministry. Millions more through ones like Mordecai Ham, and the other, there's another Billy who was saved. And he liked baseball. Who's that? Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday. And J. Wilbert Chapman. And F.B. Meyer. And Dwight L. Moody. And all because of a businessman named Ed. All because of a man named Ed. Who said, my main business is what? God's business. So a heritage, heritage is passed down from each of these to their families. And to all those they reached. And they are now witnessing and preaching and reaching many others. Like his Billy Graham's son, right? Just came from Albany. And his daughter. Preaching the word of God. So I'm so thankful that Aquila and Priscilla understood that though they were tent makers by trade, their main business was what? Serving God. What's your main business, folks? What is it, really? See, a great family is a saved family, a serving family. And thirdly, it must be a sanctified family. And that means set apart. Sanctified means set apart, separated from the world. We're too wrapped up in the world today. In Romans chapter 16, verse 5, it says, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Do you know it was in A.D. before the church ever had such a thing as its own building? The church is a body of believers, and for more than 200 years, the church met in homes. This reminds me of the simplicity of what is the church? They didn't have anything that we, we today think we have to have in order to have a church. They didn't have a building or padded chairs. Not at all. Nor a PA system, nor a projector, nor a screen, nor air condition, no advertising, no literature, no website. They didn't have any of those things, et cetera, et cetera. They did so much with so little, and we seem to do so little with so much. We do today. Think about that. You can feel the spirit move if you're knee deep in carpet or sitting in sawdust. Doesn't matter. So this couple had a great home. And it led to a great church. So how about the church that is your home? How about that? See, our highest calling is our own children, our own marriage, and our own home. Yes, our church family. That's our calling. So I hope everyone here can have a saved family that knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
That's your priority. And they're a serving family, serving the Lord daily. And they are a sanctified family, set apart for the master's use. So I ask you as I close, where are you today as a family, a church family, a home family? Where are your children at? Oh, I know where they're at. I make sure they're going to college and get a degree and get a big job and make money. I know what that's like. Was that first when we read the Bible? It's serving God. That's our business as a family. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word as we look at Priscilla and Aquila and their life, how they were changed by the love of Christ. And that's my prayer, Lord, that people know Jesus first as their Lord and Savior. Because you're in Christ, you're a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. You have a new life. I thank you, Father, that you touched my heart that way. And my prayer was, did I lose my children? Because they were teenagers, my wife, because I wasn't serving you and knowing you. He'll change your life. And then your business will be God's business. So my prayer is that here, at this church family, in their homes, they've all served you first, Lord. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.